Welcome everybody to the cast from the coast. My name is Adam Miles and I'm joined as always by Josh Lambert and Tim Johnson. Tim, what are we discussing tonight? We are discussing the very underappreciated, amazing film by very talented writer-director John Carpenter. We're talking about the 1988 classic, They Live. Obey. Tim, break down the synopsis for us, please. Well, a drifter discovers a pair of sunglasses that allows him to wake up to the fact that aliens have taken over the Earth using subliminal mind-altering propaganda that you can only see with these sunglasses. That's the end of the synopsis, and I kind of went off the rails adding stuff. But that's it. (laughs) All right. Well, that makes sense, I guess. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sure. So if you say so. Let's talk about this movie. This is 100% John Carpenter fair. Doesn't matter. This movie has the same feel and love as you would get when you're watching anything else from John Carpenter, such as The Thing, uh, Big Trouble Little China, etc., etc., etc. Um, where to begin with this story? So we have Rowdy Rowdy Piper as a vagrant running running around uh, from place to place looking for jobs. A down on his luck construction worker. Down on his luck. Sure. He's he's just drifting down on his luck construction worker. He finds a job and he basically moves into like a tent city for like homeless Mm -hmm. uh, in the area. Garbage town. Yeah, and he st- yeah, and he starts to find uh, some oddities as to what's going on around him, specifically having to do with a church that's at the edge of this garbage town. And um, he's a pretty curious fella. He's a very curious fella, and uh, he starts to find that there's something more than meets the eye going on over there. And uh, well, after he knocks uh, a wall down in the church when he's snooping around, he finds cardboard boxes doesn't bother opening them and then all of a sudden the place is raided the next night and when he breaks back into the place it's like nothing had ever existed in there that he had previously seen he breaks down that wall again opens up one of the boxes and it's just full of ray-ban style sunglasses to which he keeps it there buries the rest of them away because they're obviously of some importance and puts on the glasses and he starts to see the subliminal messages and he starts to get loopy, which is like a big thing in this. They talk about the fact that it's like, you know, taking a screw to the skull, this, this euphoric state that you enter when you're waking up, quote unquote, and it starts to uncover things. But not only is it uncovering the, the subliminal messaging that's everywhere, which has become part of pop culture. Absolutely. Whether people realize this movie or not, this is where it all stems from. Um, he starts to see that there are aliens among us and it makes for one of my favorite sequences in the movie where he's talking about the, the ugly lady versus the pretty lady. He's like, she looks like shit. Hey. No, you look fine though, but she, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's going on about it. Um, and it becomes, uh, it turns him into a target to which he finds out that there are more people, obviously, who understand this and see this, and they're trying to stop this, and it becomes a whole fight for the human race at this point, because they're already here. They're already in with us. Um, so, 
are the aliens integrated in with society or are they only the purchasers? Are they only the one percenters? Like mm-hmm. I didn't, I was trying to see if there was any of them that were like working at the tills or anything like that, but I think they were just the people that were like the the high end people. They are so so right. it starts it starts off that they are essentially the high end people. They're the they're the they are the one percent. They're the right. Donald Trumps, they are et cetera, et cetera. Um, but they they bring on almost like familiars. They hire uh, humans give them and give them wealth and power to to join their ranks and to help them keep the rest of the humans in line and keep them asleep. Mm. Uh, but yeah, they're basically they represent all the the power and money in the world at this point. And that's that's where it is. And that's that's where that subliminal messaging becomes powerful in this movie. It's because they have the ability with all the money and the power and everything else to actually produce this and to keep people in that sleep state. Right. And you always hear the, the conspiracy theorists and and not even necessarily the conspiracy theorists. You hear the people talking about the realistic nature of the fact that government entities and, uh, and, and, you know, like the, the most powerful one percenters in the world today are basically the ones who control everything and they're keeping everybody down, keep the poor, poor and the rich, rich and all that kind of shit. Well, this movie's basically what really kind of kicked off that, yeah, it's political yeah, yeah. commentary. It is one hundred percent social political commentary. It's 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 entirely what it is. So I hope that answers that, Josh. Yes. I just thought it was a little weird that they're like in the line at the grocery store and getting their hair did. It's like these are supposed to be like the high and the fucking CEOs and the CEOs government operators. No. They just pay people to go to get their groceries and buy their newspapers. True, too. It's true, too. Okay. Uh, characters in this. So we got Rowdy Rowdy Piper, obviously, as... Was it Nada? Yep. Yeah, Nada. Nada. <clears throat> Nada. Not a thing. Um, I love Rowdy Rowdy Piper. He was always one of my favorite parts of the WWF back in the days. And uh, I always loved the one It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> he was like amazing in that show. So yeah. this this movie is I don't care what anybody says, he might be a little bit corny in his acting, but he's awesome and he's got a great presence on the camera. He really does. Um doesn't help that the guys just kick ass, period. So uh See it splits me because is the movie wanting to be taken seriously and it's political commentary, or is it a B movie? With it's fucking both. Rowdy it's, Rowdy it's Piper being a fucking both. goofball. It's both. It's one hundred percent both. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me, John. I like I like in like uh, recent interviews before he passed away, where he was saying, "This isn't a movie, man. This is a documentary." <laughs> well, with the way that the world is turned today, it pretty much is. So you know. Yeah, no, it, 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 it is really a movie that, uh, it, it's not that it tries to take itself seriously, but it <clears throat> uses the B-movie corny aspect to kind of open your eyes so that you're not sitting there going, oh, they're trying to politicize me. No, you're looking at it kind of going, this is so fucking stupid, but true. The way that, you know, like it is, it's like, oh, fuck, really? No, well, you know what? That's that's kind of the way that things are. And you laugh about it, and it's true. You know what I mean? That's They kind of go that aspect with it, right? Carpenter was very smart the way that he wrote this. And I'm just going to put it out there. The soundtrack in this movie. Pure Carpenter, gorgeous soundtrack. It's nothing that you don't love about that. Uh, so Roddy Roddy Piper, uh, obviously. Uh, and so he's thrown into the middle of it. And uh, he spits off one-liners that everybody loves. I'm here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm, and I'm all, all out of bubble, out of bubble gum. gum. Beautiful shit. Beautiful shit. Then we have the the master of the hour, who is basically the one that gets into the 18 minute slugfest with Roddy Roddy Piper and holds his own. We have Keith David, who plays Frank. Keith David was amazing. He is, and you know what? I love him because he's such a badass in this movie. I love his standoffish asshole attitude in this movie. Because he's all about, you know, I don't want nothing to do with your bullshit. I don't want nothing to do with that. I just want to be. I just want to live my life. Leave me the fuck alone. And it's brilliant. And he's perfect in this movie. He's a perfect character in this movie. Um, and then we have Meg Foster. Who, she's weird. 
She is very weird. She is very weird. Those those searing blue eyes, like she. Yeah. Is, I don't know. She's weird. Uh, she plays Holly, who uh, is obviously an infiltrator to the situation, <clears throat> and uh, you know, bitch uh, backstabs the human race. So you know, nobody likes her. <laughs> Um. Yeah, there's other characters that are in there. Like you've got the blind priest, and you've got the people who are running the place, and um, <clears throat> everybody else is basically fodder in this movie. Those are kind of like your main characters to run the story with, by any means. Josh. Yes. You seen this movie? Was this your first time seeing this movie? It is. So I've seen, um, the the monsters like the aliens. I've seen that face uh a lot but i never had a movie to put it to yeah so now i've seen the movie kind of makes a little more sense when you see some of the political figures that have been redone and shit like that yeah yeah Yeah. okay um why don't you uh, go ahead and give us your 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 thoughts and your notes on this so my first viewing of they live took place october 25th 2020 at 3 14 p.m uh it's john carpenter so I'm in for a ride. That's good. Uh, my first note here was uh, garbage shanty town. Okay. Uh, what the fuck is a TV hacker? Is that a thing? Can you hack into TV? Signal back then. Yeah. Yeah. It's like analog though. How do you oh. <clears throat> take over the airwaves, buddy? There was yeah. there was a there was a case that someone actually did this on did um, a station, and uh, they dressed up as Max Hedrum. And... I remember that. Yeah. That was awesome. Cool. Uh, what's up with all the chemicals in the church? Are they making meth or something? Uh, this is some crazy political satire. Full on police state. Oh, they're breaking the garbage town. And then I just wrote sunglasses? Question <laughs> mark. Uh, what the fuck? Sunglasses that show you subliminal messages. So the 1% are aliens that are controlling us. What the fuck, number two, uh, watch communication devices. Dude, you just shot two cops in broad daylight. Got bad news for for you. (laughs) You're not talking your way out of that one. Uh, Quote, I came here to chew bubble gum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubble gum. Mama don't like tattletales. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, he's pretty much become Duke Nukem or Ash. Like, he's he's, he's dropping the one-liners. Duke Nukem still uh, one uh, from him. True. Very, very true. <clears throat> uh, so not all the cops are aliens. They've just kind of, like, integrated into society. So some of them are police... But do the human police know that the alien police have, like, an ulterior motive? Some of them don't even know that they're alien police. Hmm. Right? They're just, you know, some of them are higher ranking. They're in controlling situations. and Right? They've strategically hmm. planted themselves. They just... He jumped through that window like a fucking madman. Uh, there's an unnatural amount of tinsel in this garbage truck when he climbs in. I don't know if they just tore down like some Christmas decorations. <laughs> but it's just like there's just a huge pile of tinsel. And I love the argument that happens where you can hear that basically the truck driver's like, "No, nah, yeah. no, nah, that's it." And he like, "No," nah, and he's like dumping the garbage again right in the alleyway. He doesn't give a shit. Uh, wear the glasses, or I'm gonna beat the shit out of you. <laughs> He really doesn't want to put those glasses on. Uh, at this movie, at this point, the movie's turned into a full-on WWF match. Yeah. He knees him to the nuts six times. I counted two. I was like, oh, uh, shit. Just drives it to him. Uh, the face when he blew the windshield in looked like it was an accident. I, I'm not convinced either one of them are good enough actors. I think that that happened, and he's like, oh, fuck. I don't think he meant to do that. Uh, how are you going to save the world when they're so bruised and battered they can't even fucking walk after beating the shit out of each other? It reminded me of that Trailer Park Boys episode where they kick the shit out of each other because they think they're Sam Squanches, so they take metal baseball bats to each other, and then the next day they're all bruised and battered. Yep. Uh, they've upgraded the contacts already. That's pretty neat. Quote, 
by 2025, the Alliance of Human Power Elite will rule. Okay. <coughs> it's coming close. What the fuck? She shot him. What a twist. And then the final little dig, uh, did you pick this up when the reporter said filmmakers like George Romano and uh, John Carpenter have gone too far? No, I didn't pick that up, actually. That's funny. Eh. Those are my notes. Not very many notes. You there wasn't it. much to, to laugh about or about this film. You enjoyed it so uh, much you didn't, you didn't take many notes. I get it. I did enjoy it. I did. I don't want to <clears throat> give you the wrong possession. And I did really like the uh, the in-color reveal at the end. Because those like, vibrant alien colors are very cool. Yeah, they are. They are. Very cool. I, I, I love it when everybody does start to see them and the aliens don't realize. Because mm. they can see each other for themselves anyway. So they're like looking at the guy in the bar. And yeah, and they all look at him and he's like... <laughs> <laughs> and then like the people on the news and then all of a sudden the woman having sex the guy's like what's up baby <laughs> it was <Yeah>. great <clears throat> it was brilliant thank you for those yes yeah, so they're they're like full on in with society they're banging humans they're living with them they're going to the bar with them yep, yep. as they basically said in the movie this is like they, they're treating earth like uh like a separate third world type colony for them basically mm. a place to go to get away from certain things, to live a different type of life, to integrate into that society, learn from them, and learn from us, and uh, and kind of... It's know, a vacation like, destination, but the looks of it, those aliens were, like, going with suitcases. Yeah, 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 yeah. It is kind of like a vacation destination, I guess, too, right? Uh, let's take a week off work and go to Earth. And what was really interesting, too, is when you see the aliens, like, they get under that pod and they go, they went two different locations. Yeah. So, like they were saying, like there's there's obviously different places for these aliens. So they're obviously jumping from world to world. This isn't the only world that they're on, other than their own, because the first one goes to the right, the second one goes to the left. So uh, they're they're skipping out everywhere in the. Aliens. I like this how one. they kind of say that like global warming is because the, the aliens are controlling it because they want to create a close environment to their home, so they increase the level of like CO two in the air. Kind of like terraforming us almost, like, you know, slowly, mm. slowly changing our atmosphere to suit their needs, yeah. My, my biggest gripe with this movie is that I don't know whether to take it seriously or not. Like, I, I think if they went either way and pushed it more towards that, it would have been a better movie. I think if they would have went full-on B-movie cheese, it would have been great. And if they would have went full-on serious, it would have been great. Why, why can't it be both, though? Why can't you no, just I, like it for both? I don't know. I do. I did like it. I think if it was too serious, the the message would almost be get laughed lost. at. It would get yeah. lost. And if yeah. it went too corny, too B movie, people would just wouldn't take it seriously anyway as an actual piece of art movie is what it is. So I really do agree that I think that the movie needs to stay in that very thin line right down the middle. Like it just it had to be because let's face it as, as corny as the movie can be, and as, as pseudo-serious as the movie can be, once again, you've seen the alien creature before, but you've never had context for it. Obey. The whole, you know, uh, <coughs> subliminal messaging, you know, and government control and right. one percenters and everything else. This is like the beginning of where all that shit came from. This original story... Uh, the story that this was based on was a short story by a gentleman by the name of like Ray Nelson from the sixties and it was called eight o'clock in the morning. And it was, it was a, it was a social socio political commentary story about, you know, humans being asleep while the, the government and the one percenters basically around us are actually aliens taking over the world. And it was only like 10 pages long or some shit like this. It was a really, really short story. And it was like Carpenter took it and just, ran with it and it the movie's nothing like the story except for the fact that it's got a general basis aliens humans are asleep we're just drones doing our thing and they're taking all the all the the power from it basically is what it is um <coughs> I'm Felissa Rose, Angela from Sleepaway Camp, and you're listening to They Cast from the Coast. Yeah! 
effects work in this movie. There isn't a lot, but what's there is really good in my opinion. Um, the aliens themselves, Josh, you bring up a good point. The the color work on these things is outstanding. Super like, vibrant. Super vibrant, and I love it because it stands out wonderfully. Um, I love the uh, artistic touch of having it that when the sunglasses are on, everything's black and white. Yeah. And that mm-hmm. made it for a really good reveal when you actually do see the aliens amongst us in true color and fashion because then you're like, well, shit, look at them. They're they're super vibrant chameleon-type colors. You know what I mean? Um, aside from a couple little cheesy things, like the first time that he blows up one of those little probe things that kind of looked a little really mm-hmm. shit, that was probably the worst of it, in my opinion. <clears throat> but, I mean, you have... It wasn't ship- that bad. But, the, but that's what I'm saying. I was like, it was kind of the worst of it. But it wasn't like, I'm not saying, oh, shit! You know what I mean? It was it was just kind of, yeah, it wasn't that cool. Well, I mean, the, the effects work was minimal. It was all about the monster effects. It was about the monsters. And, I mean, even down to when they get into the gunfights near the end. Yeah, like that you was see some squib You see some squib work and a little bit of blood and stuff like this. But that was about it. Like, there wasn't much to it at all. It was all about the aliens and getting that view of what was going on. Um, this movie, one of the biggest things that it had going for it was the actual writing and the dialogue right down to when he shoots those cops and he's like, "Haha, you fuckers die like us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like everything is like this huge reveal to him as it's going through. And I, and I really appreciated that. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to say <laughs> on that. Tim, you love this movie. You got I do, and I'm just movie. waiting for you to shut the fuck up. Shutting up now, Tim. Yes, I do love this movie. I love this movie a lot. Um, I feel that it's kind of one of those, those. Even though it was, you know, from '88 or whatever, it's 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 got like this kind of timeless quality to it because the. Wow, that's, that's really loud in my ear, whoever's making that what? noise, yawning and stuff. This is really loud. He's still doing it. Just make... <laughs> Anyways, um, it's it's uh, um, it's it's kind of timeless. Um, you know, the 1% versus the 99. Um, the, the aliens don't look like anything, but they, they look like humans, kind of, but if we had all our skin taken off and we're red and blue and um, yeah, I, I, I love this movie. Yes. So um... one of my effects guys that I buy masks from does a they live mask and it's very good. And seeing this movie makes me kind of want to have one. So yeah, they did a good job. Get a Trump haircut on it. <laughs> I I I always wanted to do a photo shoot of they live. <clears throat> yeah, I thought it'd be it'd be awesome. I heard somewhere recently that somebody was actually doing a short film, like a continuation, like what happened just afterwards, like just following the aftermath of what had just happened at the end of the movie, and uh, kind of mm. like some of the aliens, kind of like dealing with the the instantaneous effects of being revealed and shit like this sounded kind of interesting um but in true in true john carpenter fashion the one thing that i really truly love about the end of this movie is as the hero lays dying the last fucking thing he does is flip off an alien (laughs) like literally just fuck you and then like the movie's over with like it was just it was beautiful because he'd already done his job at this point he's already done with everything right yeah. <clears throat> uh, Tim. What? Would you like to rate and give your final thoughts on this movie? We're not doing trivia? Didn't they have any trivia? Oh, it's just yeah. a John Carpenter movie. I, I guess I guess we'll just we'll, we'll just go just, through it again. Let's just do the wow. trivia. Let's do the trivia. Oh, you're going you're going to wow. just let me, you're going to just let me do it. Thanks, Adam. Wow. Thank you for letting me do my section of the show. Fine. Thank you. Trivia time with Tim, everybody. No, fuck you. I don't want to do it now. <laughs> don't want to do it. Trivia time with Tim, everybody. 
Why do they talk into these here's, little watches? Here's a piece of so trivia. Weird. I got a piece of trivia. It's it, this it, this <laughs> one this Don't one's do about. It. Don't do it. <laughs> this one's about a little road that belongs to Adam, and it sucks. <sighs> <sighs> All right, trivia time with Tim. The line. I have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass, and I'm all out of bubblegum, was completely 100% ad lib by Roddy Piper. According to John Carpenter, Piper had previously written a line in a notebook as a potential um, interview point for wrestling. Um, and he shared the notebook with Carpenter, and they agreed that this particular line fit the character in the film perfectly. Piper went on to use it, at a, wrestling, uh, at a wrestling match. So that would have been pretty awesome to see. Um, the big fight sequence designed, rehearsed, and choreographed in the backyard of John Carpenter's production office, the fight between Nada, Roddy Piper, and Frank Keith David, was only supposed to last 20 seconds. But Piper and David <laughs> decided to fight imagine. it out. They decided to fight it out for real, only faking the hits to the face and groin. They rehearsed the fight for three weeks. Carpenter was so Im- impressed by it that he kept the complete scene intact, which runs five minutes and 20 seconds. Can you imagine being the cinematographer or like the cameraman or something? Be like, all right, we're just going to film this quick shot, uh, punch him in the face, and go. <laughs> and then you're just filming for fucking 20 minutes while they're beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> hey guys, you can stop now. <sighs> uh, it doesn't stop. Roddy Piper. Being a married man at the time of filming, refused to take off his wedding band. That I is why seven scenes he has a wedding ring on. Um, Piper's character gives his name, uh, nor oh, Piper never gives his name nor is referred to by name throughout the entire mo- movie. He's simply nis- listed as Nada in the credits which means nothing in Spanish and Portuguese. The name is almost certainly a reference to the character George Nada in the uh, Ray Faraday Nelson's short story, 8 o'clock in the morning, from which the film was adapted. Um, This was brought up by Josh earlier. One of the alien TV broadcasts refers to the director by name. An alien commentator is complaining about the sex and violence in media and is dialogue breaks off with some words filmmakers like George A. Romero and John Carpenter have to show some restraint they simply and then it cuts off Uh, Carpenter brought real homeless folks in for production for several weeks as smaller characters gave them food as well as paychecks I thought it was a pretty classy thing to do Piper said that is awesome uh, that is actually really awesome. Um, John Carpenter was impressed with Keith David's performance in The Thing, and he needs someone who wouldn't be the traditional sidekick, but could hold his own. Yep. To this end, Carpenter wrote the role of Frank specifically for Keith David. Uh, Vince McMahon didn't want Piper to do the film. Yeah, I figured, Carpenter says. McMahon told Piper that he would find him a different film at the same pay rate within four weeks. But Piper passed and ended up uh, splitting with the WWF. Carpenter asked why, and Piper simply stated that my man is a control freak. When I came back to wrestling, I was twice as important as when I left, he says, and the credits Carpenter and the success of the film. The politics of that business is something that I don't even get. Now this is what I always loved, and this is what I'm going to end it on. Last piece of trivia. The role of Nada was, of course, originally written for Kurt Russell. (laughs) But Carpenter felt that he should cast someone else after casting Russell in four of his films prior to this one. (laughs) Elvis, 1979, Escape from New York, 1981, Thing, 1982, and Big Trouble in Little China, 1986. And the communicator used by the guards near the end is also the same PKE meter used in Ghostbusters. I love that. I I pointed that out to Jacob. I was like, look at that. Look at that, PKE. He's like, oh my gosh, it's Ghostbusters stuff. I'm like, yeah, I know. I love how they cross you stuff like that. So that was the last one? That's it. There's a bunch. 
Yeah, that's the, just, just a the bunch. last of these saying. Okay. Yeah, that's that's the trivia last time with Tim. Trivia yeah. time with Tim. Wow. Right. wow. Wow. Fine. Now we can actually review the movie. Tim, you may go. I just fucking talked for five minutes. You can... <laughs> Fine. Moving on to Josh. Um, no, I'm already going. I moved up. I'm close to the mic. I've already moved. Um, I feel that this this movie is is very unappreciated and kind of looked over when it comes to John Carpenter titles. Um, I feel that um, it's just as good as any other entry in John Carpenter's filmography. Um, I love this movie. I love uh, Roddy Piper in it. I love Keith David. I love the like I said earlier, the timeless message behind it. Um, I think the, the editing was really, really cool. Um, like the very jarring nature of putting the glasses on and everything that you think, you know, is completely different and has always been different. Like, I just, I thought that was really cool. Like I really wanted those sunglasses as a kid. Like I really did. Right. Um, it, it's not really a horror movie. And it's not really a science fiction movie. It's just a John Carpenter movie. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's got elements of all this stuff. Nice but it's not any clear, this belongs in the horror titles or the yeah, you're right. whatever. It's right? a little bit action movie, a little bit horror, a little bit sci-fi. Yeah, a little bit like comedy. political, cerebral. Yeah, and I think that's why I like it, because it's just John Carpenter. Um, the music was great. Um, though very minimal, um, special effects were pretty good. Um, those, those, those aliens, uh, like I was saying earlier, are, are pretty timeless and unique. Um, like Josh said, he didn't know what they were from, but he knew what they were like, you know what I mean? Like this is the alien from this movie. Oh yeah. I remember that. You know what I mean? Um, I also like that it's kind of made a resurgence and people are doing like, you know, fucking uh, Pepsi commercials with with the Kardashians and the glasses, and she's she's one of them. Or or drawing, you know, Donald Trump and you know, obey and all that. Like I, I love that shit. I love it. I think it's cool that it's kind of coming back. Um, I think this is one of those movies that's absolutely a cult classic. Like yeah. by definition, it is a cult classic. Um, I give this a fucking. I give this. I give this an R. I'd love to give it an X, but it's not my favorite Carpenter movie. It's up there, but it's not Halloween or, or uh, you know, the thing. The thing, you know. Um, and I, th- I think just because it is just you know a bunch of different things. Um, yeah, I get it, it's it's absolutely recommended. Absolutely, hmm. R at a minimum. Good stuff. Good stuff. Josh. It's almost an X. It's almost an X. And it's it's too good for an R. You know what I mean? Like it's it's in it's right it's in there. Go ahead, Josh. I'm sorry. Oh, it's all right. Um I really like this movie. And I like that I now have a story to go with that face. But I think, in all honesty, that face is the best part of the movie. That that final reveal of like the super vibrant blue aliens. Like that makeup. Uh, that effect is what made the movie for me. Um, and the the fact that it was black and white leading up to makes you want to see it more. And I wish that I hadn't already known, like, that face, like, that color scheme. Because, like I said, I, I, I've seen that before already. So when it finally came to reveal it, I kind of already knew what I was looking at. But mm. it was very cool. Um, <laughs> Rody, Rody, uh, I don't... He he was a cornball man. Like he was, like I said, a mix of Rambo and Duke Nukem. Uh, I didn't know whether or not I should take him seriously, or or uh, is this like political commentary or whatever. But uh, it's a very fun movie. Um, I like B movies and I like the cheese, which was good. And then it's also a very cerebral movie, so I'm thinking a lot about it. Like, uh, okay, what what did at this time were they commentating on? Like what? Uh, the one percenters or whatever. So I'm also going to give it an hour. I highly recommend you go watch it. It's definitely a cult classic. Um, the fact that I knew the monster and I'd never even seen the movie tells that. So, yeah. 
Nicely said. Nicely said. I this is the kind of movie that I wanted more stories in that universe. I know that they Yeah, have, yeah. Things like, you know, come to a head at the end of this movie with, you know, him destroying the, the satellite link and then the reveal and flipping off the alien and shit. But I wanted more I want to know more about when they truly came around, how long they've been doing what they did, how did they start getting the process rolling on us and shit like this. Like those are some really cool things that even if they just had a book, I would read the fuck out of that. Just to just to kind of hear a little bit more about it. But I want to see stuff like that too. And I can, I can imagine that it would have been a really good story in my opinion. Um, <clears throat> it was a tragic movie too. So that's one thing that you got to keep in mind is that it's, it is an action. It's somewhat horror. It's sci-fi. It's, it's, it's got drama to it, but it, in the, in the term of drama, it's a tragedy because for one, looking at it not just as a social political commentary it has to do with the fact that technically the aliens succeeded in doing this they basically destroyed uh you know the, the mindset of the average citizen of the world they they succeeded in 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 coming into into power and and restraining and creating this problem and at the end truly the only person that was able to stand up to them fell to him you know it's a very fucking shakespearean story in my opinion it's but he fucked them over at the end (laughs) exactly he got them but once again he what he himself was in fact a a casualty to the situation even though he fucked them over and and he won but he fell as a casualty so it's it, it was tragic that way and i always really respected that side of it because it could very well have been one of these movies where you know, action sequence, he blew up the thing and jumped off the side of the, the thing and, you know, and swung away to safety or some shit. Anything could have really happened. But in this movie, it was almost like the, the, the fitting ending to the thing. Yeah. Where does it go from here? I almost, see, as much as I would love a sequel, I'm almost happy that there isn't one. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, come on, can you imagine, like, they still live? Yeah. I'd like a, a reboot. An uh, in current era reboot. Some some sort of a, a reboot would be interesting for sure, especially if it had Carpenter's blessing. Oh, or if Carpenter like the the same kind of care that they did with the the new um, Halloween, the new Halloween. Um, yeah, I want more stories, but I mean, I almost feel like a reboot would lose the charm. That 80, 88 charm, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to be able to replace, uh, Roddy Piper. No. Um, they're going to update the look of the, the, the aliens. Um, and that was part of that made it unsettling was it was, you know, obviously we could make them look better now, (coughs) but they'd probably change the design. Right. Hmm. Yeah, (coughs) it's true. Just Um, saying. True. No, I mean, good points. Good points. But yes, I truly do want more. I want to know more about this. I want to know more yeah. about this. And it, it and coming away from a movie that I've probably seen this movie a good dozen or more times alone. Um, you know, not on a heavy set like some of my most favorite movies, but like about a dozen times I've seen this movie and it never gets boring to me. Um, even in the slow parts of this movie, the movie's so fucking beautifully made. You're just mm-hmm. staring at everything, you know, right from the moment when the train goes by at the beginning and he's walking across the train tracks. I'm looking at the graffiti and the. I love how the title fades into like I love that. That's like such a cool, yeah. Edit, yeah. The editing in this is so good. Absolutely. So, without a doubt, this movie sits very, very, very high on my recommended list, and and I agree. It's hard to, you know, for for a for a show like us where we we talk about horror um where this movie doesn't necessarily fit 100 percent into the horror category john carpenter is a master of horror so you can't mm-hmm. ignore fucking beautiful movies like this from a master of horror so Agreed. you know what whatever people might say out there this movie pure pure r rating recommended this is one of those movies you have to see in life 
regardless of your political views <laughs> in on life, in you life, have to see, see it. <laughs> as you live. But this is the, this is one of the first times I'll ever say this about a movie because there's only very few movies that that have such an impact on culture. Um, me personally, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is my favorite movie ever made, regardless of genre. This movie. If I was to write a list right now of one of those 101 movies that you must see before you die, this movie would sit up high on that list for me. Because regardless of how you feel, it might not be your most favorite movie in the world, but the actual impact on culture that it's had is, you know, you just you just can't, you know, brush that off. It's a beautiful movie. So, once again, rated R, recommended. That's three R's, gentlemen. That's the triple R. That is the triple R. And I'm happy, Josh, that you gave this an R because you're first watching and, you know, it's good. Yeah, classic. I thought, I, I, yeah, I, th- I didn't know where you were going to go with it, Josh. I, di- I didn't know when we first we first sat down to talk. Like, I, I wasn't sure. I was nervous. I enjoyed it. I, yeah. Like I said, I do have some gripes with it. I didn't need a fucking 15-minute fucking WWE match in the middle of my it was spot. amazing <laughs> it was put on the fucking glasses long. it seemed like it never ended it was just a, they beat the shit of each other and he falls down he's like pulling him up it's like okay put the glasses on him and he's like no he sucker punches him and then they they're down into it again and then the other guy's down he's like oh okay he's not gonna put the glasses on he's walking away and then he gets back up and he fucking boots him yeah it's non-stop seems like it lasted moves. a long time <laughs> excellent excellent all right gentlemen <clears throat> excuse me all right Thank you very much. This has been a good conversation that we've had tonight there, and I look forward to more of these conversations in the very near future. So with that, thank you everybody for tuning in and checking us out on this special episode of the Cast from the Coast where we review yet another of the Master of Horror John Carpenter's movies. Check us out on Facebook, Misunderstood Our Company. Like, share, and subscribe. Check us out on YouTube. Like, share, and subscribe. Misunderstood Our Company as well. We produce audio copies of this show every week when we release them on other platforms on podcasting platforms all the major platforms including but not limited to google play itunes spotify and amazon music we also have a patreon account open up your hearts and your wallets and donate to the patron to the to the patron cause today until next time josh look i'm just here to watch horror movies and chew bubblegum and i'm all out of bubblegum (laughs) nicely done nicely done tim Obey and stay spooky. (laughs) See you next time, folks. Good night.